Ladies and gentlemen, there once was a woman from Pleasant Town. Her name was Maureen. She lived a busy and rewarding life with her husband, Michael, and their two children, Ethan and Mara, six year old twins. They lived on a quiet, tree lined street, one of the many in Pleasant Town, and not far from the towering skyline of a nearby city. Maureen was the type of person that we all like to call friend. She was compassionate, witty, intelligent, unselfishly giving of her time and of her talent. She was passionate about positive social change and the environment. She was a member of the local parent-teacher association for her children's school. And she sang in the church choir, although not very well, I might add. But she didn't seem to mind as much as her congregation did. No matter, her heart was in the right place. Maureen was at 183 centimeters tall, statuesque. She had blonde wispy hair, and penetrating blue eyes, compassionate eyes, truthful eyes. She was a beautiful person, inside and out. My life certainly has been enriched having Maureen as a friend. She was, above all, a devoted mother and a loving and supportive wife. And as busy as she was, with work and the children and running a household, Maureen always made sure she took care of herself. She didn't smoke. She tried to eat right. She went to yoga class regularly at the Pleasant Town YMCA. And she participated in several locally sponsored charity runs and events. But cancer. Cancer is a capricious adversary and plays no favorites. Now, Maureen was never one to run to the doctor anytime she was feeling out of sorts. And she dismissed the telling signs of what she was eventually to find out. She knew something was seriously wrong. As a result, Maureen's illness went undiagnosed and untreated far longer than it should. By the time her diagnosis was confirmed, her cervical cancer was at stage three. Still, she kept her spirits high and she was known for this fabulous positive attitude. Maureen was encouraged to learn that a new generation, second and third generation of chemotherapy drugs called cytotoxics were largely responsible for managing this disease and they were largely responsible for the significant trend in five-year survival rates of those with cervical cancer. And after a successful surgery to remove cancerous tumors on her cervix, Maureen weighed her options for treatment, and she discussed these at great length with her doctor, her oncology team, and her husband. She also researched on her own and eventually opted for a platinum-based chemotherapy, a combination of two drugs that, when taken together, proved to be considerably more effective than when taken alone. And this regimen was the mainstay for treatment of cervical cancer. She began her infusion therapy right away, and everyone, everyone, was optimistic about the prognosis for the woman from Pleasant Town. Now, 
Maureen had this friend. This friend once worked for a major drug company, a biological drug manufacturer, to be more precise. And she assumed that his experience somehow qualified him as an expert in how drugs worked, everything from you know, their side effects to what drugs you took for what treatments. But he was an engineer, not a pharmacologist. And the details on how these miracle medicines performed the miraculous things they did were as much a mystery to him as they were to most other people. No. This was not his area of expertise at all. His area of expertise was in knowing how to protect such drugs from the potential and damaging effects of temperature abuse throughout an incredibly complex supply chain, from the manufacturer to the patient. And this was some challenge. For Maureen's friend realized that it was not widely known in Pleasant Town or beyond that drugs like those Maureen was taking could be so sensitive to changes in temperature as to render them adulterated, diminish their effectiveness, and, and in some instances, render certain cytotoxic drugs dangerously more toxic. Now, the adulteration of biological drugs isn't something most people think about or even remotely question. And the general population of Pleasant Town was no different. People there blithely accepted the drugs that they took, that they purchased, that were prescribed, that were administered to them as being safe, pure, effective, but Maureen's friend knew that from the time a drug is manufactured to the time it reaches the patient, it has traveled a long, circuitous, and not always temperature-stable supply chain. But trying to be as supportive as he could for his friend, he did some probing on his own and looked at the pharmacology behind the two therapies that Maureen was taking. Now, beyond their astonishing complexity, what he immediately caught his attention was the fact that both of the drugs in her regimen were indeed temperature sensitive. One, a lyophilized powder. Storage requirement, keep at two to eight degrees C. The other, a liquid. Store below 25 degrees C, do not freeze. Now, these storage requirements, he knew, placed these particular drugs at a high risk for adulteration. And that special packaging, storage, and transportation were necessary, vital, in fact, for maintaining their effectiveness. Maureen responded very well to her treatment. The drugs were administered at one of the nation's leading oncology ha hospitals, which happened to be in the city with the towering skyline near Pleasant Town. She received a two-day intravenous dose every three to four weeks, and she suffered the usual concaminants of such drugs, nausea, hair loss, fatigue, and some blood test abnormalities, but certainly nothing beyond the ordinary. She was closely monitored by her doctors and the, her oncology team, and her doctors she knew well. She trusted. And they were very careful in not proceeding with her treatment protocols until tests demonstrated that her platelet count, her renal output, her liver function, her visual and auditory functions were all within acceptable ranges. But then, Maureen's third treatment, things changed drastically. She no longer responded as she previously had. 
And her doctor said, her renal and blood tests were not showing the same levels of response to the, to the combination of cytotoxics as they had in the past. Why? Why, she asked her doctor. Well, he gave her a litany of possibilities. And soon afterward, Maureen's health began to falter, and the doctor was telling her and her husband that the time had come for them to concentrate on palliative care, aimed at ensuring she had a better quality end of life than to try to put any additional hopes in curative treatment. As her family and friends watched this insidious disease progress and slowly drain the life from Maureen, her friend was compelled to do some further investigating because he could not, he could not get out of his mind the words the doctor said, that her renal and blood tests were not showing the same levels of response to the combination of cytotoxics as they previously had. Could this have occurred as a result of an adulterated drug from exposure to temperature abuse? He wondered. His experience told him that if this were to happen, it would most likely occur in the distribution process. And this was an area that he knew well and where he concentrated his efforts. Maureen's friend contacted colleagues he knew at the manufacturing facilities where these drugs were made to find out all that he could. Now, both companies of these drugs were among the best in their field. Right? They had long-standing reputations for producing and maintaining the highest quality medicines. One of the drugs he found curious was made in only one location, a country far, far away from Pleasant Town. Now, working with colleagues he knew in the Manufacturer's International Logistics Department, Maureen's friend was actually able to determine the point of entry of this drug into North America. The goods were received at the airport in the city with the towering skyline, near Pleasant Town. And this airport, this airport had a notorious reputation for mishandling and misstorage procedures. There were no quality agreements in place, for instance, among supply chain partners. And little in the way of direct communication between the air carrier and the ground company, the ground crew who was subcontracted to handle and store these temperature sensitive products. And to complicate matters, the only storage facility at the airport in the city with the towering skyline was shared among many airlines, including the air carrier that carried the particular chemotherapy drug from the country far, far away from Pleasant Town that Maureen had been taking. This cold room was used mainly not for drugs, but for perishables, fresh fish, fruits, vegetables, plants, meat, and cut flowers, all of which have their own sets of temperature requirements for storage. And the most frequent user of this cold room at the airport in the city with the towering skyline near Pleasant Town happened to import roses, roses by the plane load from the far off country of Fleurland. Now, the wholesaler of these roses paid extra to have the thermostat in the cold room at the airport set at zero degrees C. Why? To keep his roses from blooming. 
The airport was happy to accommodate him because all the roses in Pleasant Town were imported from Fleurland. And this meant the airport stayed very busy. The importer likewise was very pleased because getting the airport to set the cooler thermostat at zero degrees C not only prevented his roses from blooming, but it increased the longevity of the bloom. And this made his customers in Pleasant Town very happy. As was often the case, temperature-sensitive drugs arriving at the airport were stored alongside the roses at zero degrees C, including drugs that are supposed to be stored at two to eight, and drugs that specifically state, do not freeze. Now, I'm sure they had the best of intentions, no doubt. But exposure to zero degree C temperatures was known to render a certain platinum-based chemotherapy drug completely ineffective. And wouldn't you know it, this was the very drug taken by Maureen from Pleasant Town. Now, whether or not the therapy Maureen was taking was exposed to freezing temperatures at the airport in the city with the towering skyline near Pleasant Town cannot be positively determined. But it's possible. And it happens. Could this have contributed in whole or in part to Maureen's premature and painful death? We'll never know. We'll never know for sure. And why? Because there is no end user regulatory requirement to include any type of device, whether it's an inexpensive chemical indicator or an electronic data logger or indicator in a commercial drug shipment that might alert anyone, anyone in the supply chain, that a drug's quality, purity, safety, efficacy might, might be compromised as a result of exposure to temperature abuse. There are a multitude of reasons why Maureen failed to respond to her treatment. But in her friend's mind, in her friend's mind, there will always be doubt. It seems uh, particularly sad and cruel that a woman like Maureen with such zest and vitality and fullness of life should be taken at such an early age, 33 years young, torn from her husband and two small children, too young to understand why their mother was leaving and never coming back. And these same sentiments were repeated over and over by the hundreds of those in attendance at Maureen's funeral. It was a cold and rainy day in Pleasant Town, the day Maureen was laid to rest. And while her family stood at her graveside consoling each other, asking themselves why, why she had to leave so soon and so sudden, her friend stood by and he couldn't help but notice that the beautiful imported roses on top of her coffin were just beginning to bloom. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>